flexibility as, as administrators and school board members to fix this. Um, you got to go back and ask, you know, who's been in charge the last 20 years that's been putting all these at, these uh, rules and regulations in place? Really but even bigger than that, even better than that, and we really should give us all an opportunity to speak. Um, even even bigger than that is there was a, a law a couple years ago, the SB 54, the Sanctuary State Law, and there were a lot of city councils, there were a lot of council, uh, counties that all stood up and took a leadership role and said, we're not going to honor this law and we're against this law. I would love to see a school board member, just one, get up and say, you know what? My school is gonna be a sanctuary school. Sanctuary cities are one thing, but sanctuary schools, we need those for our kids. And a zero tolerance po policy is easy. They violate your policy, you kick them out of the school. You tell their parents, go find another place to take care of their kids. And I understand it'll be a hardship on people, but then parents are gonna start to, to live up to their responsibility and take care of their kids. I mean, this is crazy that kids in school districts right here in our Inland Empire have committed suicide, have been beaten up. I mean, this is crazy. Another uh, kid in, in Moreno Valley is, is brain dead right now. Um, this has gotta stop. And it's something that, um, that I think we need some leadership in our school boards and our school districts, and we need some, some school board members to stand up and say, I've had enough of this, and I don't care if it's against the law, and I don't care if the state of California says it's against the law, I'm gonna stand up for my kids. Um, and, and people might say, well, Lloyd, that's easy to say. Well, I did it when, it when it affected my city, and I think the school board members and teachers, the CTA should stand up and take a, take a no bully, zero tolerance uh, position and fix this. Thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. Where's Lucia? From a school board uh, perspective, school board member perspective, and as a parent, I'm not sure that, and correct me, any school board members here or any on the board here, but I don't think any school district allows or permits bullying. None of us do. No one. As a parent, I don't pass the buck to anyone. I make sure that I'm educating my children to be respectful and civil to, it doesn't matter where you're coming from, what the color of your skin is, or how rich or poor you are. Civility and respect is incredibly important, and as leaders, it starts with us modeling what is what is expected on in a, in a society that we live in that's it that's why we live in a society that means civil rules that exist having said that um it is unfortunately that we are suffering as a culture as a society from behavioral uh, mental health issues um, that have incrementally increased um, in the past what, 20 30 years we have the highest suicide rates and depression that we've ever had. I'm looking at the quality of life for people. If parents are not able to provide for their families and have secure incomes and have secure um, jobs and be able to provide their families, that causes a lot of anxiety and stress. When parents are working two to three jobs and cannot be there for their children, that affects the well-being of those children. Um, I think we're seeing a lot of um, social ills because the quality of life is not there. And that has to look at, at what is causing that. Um, we have to look at the root of the problem. Those are symptoms that I'm looking at. Um, if a child is bullying, what I've told my children is that you have to think where they're coming from. Are their parents there? Do they have a support system? Why are they doing it? Normally, they themselves are being victims of something, not justifying it, it's absolutely wrong, but we have to look at the root of the problem. We have to look at the well-being of our society or our families, and that's why I'm running as well, because we're not doing well as a society, and we need leadership that's going to help families thrive so that they can live in a dignified way. It's heartbreaking to see that I completely agree with what Rosalie is saying. We have seen the demise of civility across our adult communication online as well as our children's communication online. And I think they're picking up on that. I don't think that we can ignore the fact that the things that they see on television, the things that they read in Facebook, the things that we see are impacting our kids as well. And we have to stop that. You know, we, we have to stop attacking one another. We're all in this together. 
you know, we want this area to be a better place, then we need to start communicating like that and start trying to problem solve like that as well. The same goes for schools. Um, you know, my, my son went to a charter school for a while and it became a haven for kids who were being bullied at other schools. And the reason that it was a haven for them was that from the earliest ages when they started in the Montessori program, they were taught care for each other, care for their community, and care for their environment. And they were taught how to voice their disagreements. They were taught how to communicate about when they were angry about something or when they weren't getting what they needed or when somebody was being too loud or when they didn't like what was happening to them to stand up for themselves or to stand up for somebody else to whom that was happening. I think that there are some really basic things that we need to restore in terms of civility at the earliest ages with kids so that they're learning that in the classroom in case they're not getting it in school. Because we are seeing parents, I mean, all of us stressed beyond belief, commuting for two hours, having three jobs, not making enough money, not being there, plopping your kid in front of the TV to see God knows what. So the, the other point that I would make is that it is entirely possible for technology companies to evaluate bullying language on the screen that they're seeing. And the apps that these kids are using are their own little playground where parents are frankly not involved. We're not seeing what's happening and that's where so much of the hurt comes, is on a tiny little screen. So I think we need to pressure and put in place legislation that would require these technology companies that want to market apps to our kids to have anti-bullying software built into it to prevent that from happening. We need to know that they're working on that and that they're taking care and they're doing their part as well. Thank you. So we just recently had, first of all, I want to say that bullying is unacceptable in all forms. Um, in our school district, we just had, and actually it was a town hall, I have to remind folks, I'm coming from the city of San Bernardino, and so for those of that you um, have heard of the reputation that we have, it's not, it's not very positive. Although what we're trying to do is positive things, it is not. So we had a town hall meeting where our school police uh, was involved, assembly member Louise Reyes. We had um, our deputy, um, our county um, sheriffs were involved, and then we also had community leaders. And what we wanted to find out is we wanted to find out from the community themselves, what are some of the struggles you're facing? And do you know what one of the topic, one of the highest topic that was um, through the night? It was bullying. Bullying was number one. I mean, we heard from parents, we heard from staff, we even heard from students themselves. And I think what we've been doing in our school district, we're trying to find ways and, um, and there's always room for improvement, but we have to find ways of better training our staff on how to deal with these situations. But what was an aha moment for me and what we can try doing at the state level as well, that I really don't think school districts are really paying attention on how to deal with bullying, is actually, you know, when, you, uh, when HR takes in harassment cases, right? So if an employee puts in that they're, they've been harassed, there's a process for that. And I think one of the complaints parents are saying is that no one's listening to us. Our children, nobody's listening to us. So if we start implementing a process, um, a reporting process, that, if, um, that will make sure that we're addressing individually and not forget on the sidelines, we will start looking at that the, the bullying cases will start being resolved at a better rate. Now, uh, will it be eliminated completely? And as it was mentioned earlier, there's still some struggles when they look at social media, when they look at television. But what we can try doing is also providing additional supports through mental health. When you look at you know, families that, that have moms and dads that are either on drugs and they're not at home and they're being taken care of by their grandparents. Um, there's a lot of issues pertaining to, we have to also analyze the issues that, that they're facing on a daily basis. Um, we, we have children walking home um, on some of the streets that are in, in, in San Bernardino that are needles and there's condoms and, and we have to be mindful you know, what these children are facing and what they're seeing every day. And so we have to look at them uh, and try to address what their personal issues as well. But um, definitely we have to look at what we can do at a state level with regarding uh, reporting, because honestly, no districts are really uh, looking and addressing that in, the, in a more in-depth um, way. So that's something that I'll bring forward.
Thank you. Before we go on, just a reminder, this is a candidate's forum. It is not a political rally. So I would appreciate it if there would be no shouting out during the uh, discussions. Thank you very much. Uh, next question. The lack of affordable housing, including housing for seniors, has become a critical problem throughout our state. It is one of the key reasons for our growing homeless crisis. What tax and other policy changes would you recommend to help us deal with this problem? I'll start with Lloyd. Uh, first of all, I just want to follow up. Um, I, I want to thank um, Abigail and Chris. Uh, those are both great ideas. And I, I had not heard that approach before with the process and with the, uh, the uh, social media. So I think, that, I think those are promising um, directions to go, and I appreciate that. Uh, regarding affordable housing, uh, it, it is a serious problem. And the problem that we have is that, you know, you hear a lot of people in California, a lot of young kids talking about, uh, they think socialism is better than capitalism. And it's because we've created an environment in California where our young kids, and I'm talking to people in their 20s and 30s, they see no hope here. They, they don't believe they can buy a home. They, if they go to college, they're, they're socked with debt because that's the only way they can afford the high education cost. They, um, and so when they start talking about socialism, which they have not, are not being taught in school what socialism really is, and it's not just a financial uh, alternative to capitalism, but it's, it's a very dramatic change in a lifestyle, they see that as an option. And they're doing that because of, in California, they're doing that because of the housing affordability crisis. The problem, and, and we see it here in Beaumont, with the, the development, well, we have one industry in the city of Beaumont, and that's home building. And we probably build homes faster and better than anyone else in the district, and probably anyone else in the state. But the cost to build a home these days, when you start talking about uh, the cost for mitigation fees, the cost for, uh, for all of the different kinds of programs that we're being asked to, to include um, recently, and, and I'm, I'm not opposed to solar, but when you're having a housing crisis, why would you force all new homes to have $10,000 worth of solar? Um, we're, there's a lot of problems with what's coming down from Sacramento. How do you fix the affordable housing problem? I think what you do is you start promoting uh, and you're bringing the jobs to where the homes are. I still think that that's the answer. I think Beaumont and this area has a lot of room for some good manufacturing jobs, which are good jobs. We also need to to get our kids also thinking about trades jobs. I mean, in, in school now, if you don't go to college, you're looked, down, looked down upon by your peers, and that wasn't the way it always was. There needs to be opportunities for kids to look at trade schools. Um, I met with the uh, Carpenters Union uh, a few weeks ago, and they can't get enough people to work in the Carpenters Union, and the problem is the average age of their new apprentice are 27. I mean, and they should be 18, 19 years old. Those are good jobs. They're good, good careers, good futures, and we're not doing enough for that. But the affordable housing, um, we got to do something different than the way um, our legislators doing now. We got to change some of those fees, some of those costs, find a way to, to uh, fast track CEQA, um, do some CEQA reform. All of those issues, I think, are ways to address it. Thank you. Thank you. So I just want to talk about, just a little bit to address what Lloyd mentioned earlier in regards to our school districts. Um, we have, I think as a school district, we're working towards career and um, career in college readiness. It's not, we understand that there's a need for trade um, um, training and um, apprenticeship programs. So we're working towards that um, as a school district. Am I correct? Abigail and well, it has to be a whole, but yes, it has to be a whole. You have to look at several avenues because then you have the, the you want to get increased skilled workforce as well as having opportunities for higher education. So we're working with all of that to make sure that we're preparing kids and have given them options yeah. um, to prepare them for tomorrow's. Um, having said that, as far as the inventory, I've been talking about how that is a big issue in California, and a lot of it has to go with the cost. Um, most of the issues that we're looking at for development are, uh, I think, just to break ground through some of the developers that I've spoken to speak about cost, the cost being that of 120 to about 140, just to break ground. 
So cost uh, to build is very expensive in California. We'd love to see um, CEQA requirements streamlined um, for a bit just to make it more feasible and more affordable to build. If we have more inventory, that will automatically affect the pricing of homes. It will make it a little easier for people to be able to afford. Also, having um, uh, partnerships between private and um, private and public entities to provide housing for people who are homeless um, populations wrapped around with services that allow for behavioral um, uh, mental health issues be very important to address some of the homeless issues that we have, especially um, just with the environment and what we're having around, uh, what we see in our in our communities right now. So um, I think increasing our inventory um, and streamlining some of the, the cost and the requirements to build would actually help with that, with the cost. Thank you. Chris. I've lived in a lot of places over the course of my life, from cities to farms to sub to suburbs, and I love the great outdoors. I love the mountains and the deserts around us, and I think that they're precious and they need to be preserved. But we also need to build, and so I would love to see more high density development in areas where we have jobs and good transportation corridors. I'm concerned about sprawl. I'm concerned about building out and out and out into areas that where we don't have the infrastructure to support them and we don't have the jobs to support them. I think this puts a lot of pressure on communities and in the long run, while the tax money is rolling in from the development, if there aren't jobs there, that's, gonna, that's a really difficult balancing act for the local municipalities to continue to maintain that. So I, I'm not a socialist. I just want to say that, be very clear about that. I am a capitalist. Um, and I do think we need to build a lot more housing. And I do think that there are probably some reforms that are necessary in CEQA so that developers aren't using important environmental legislation as a method of beating each other up and causing an explosion in the, in the cost of homes. Um, I also know that there are probably regulations that need to be examined and looked at. I think the Trump tariffs are definitely causing the price of housing to go up in the state, and those being lifted would certainly lower the cost of housing here as well. So the, we need to streamline, the other place that we need to streamline the development of housing is on the local level. There's a lot of folks who say that they want us to build more housing, and they see that this is a problem. They don't want to have homeless people. But they don't necessarily want it in their backyard. and. That, we need, to, we need to address that and start looking at how do we address the homeless issue because it is tied to the affordable housing issue. Can we house, house families? Can we provide um, services for vets? Can we get people off the streets and into the right kind of program for mental health or the right kind of program for addiction treatment so that those are not the burden being placed on the folks that would be living near uh, facilities such as that. So again, I'm, we have to build more housing. I know that it's a supply issue um, and it has to be the right kind of housing near jobs and near transportation. Thank you. Thank you. Well, when you look at housing, as it was mentioned before, you look at um, where you're able to attract, you know, some place that is close by where you can work. And when you look at transportation and so forth, but at the same time, uh, one thing I love about City of Redlands, and I don't live in City of Redlands, um, but one thing that they do have is the fact that they have small businesses and they're really flourishing small businesses. And what they're doing um, is different in the essence that they're providing incentives and they're providing resources for individuals that want to create small businesses. And they try to eliminate these big, um, um, because they want to create a small family uh, community feel. And, and a lot of you live in Beaumont and you have that uh, opportunity where you create those small um, environments. And so when you create the, so I just wanted to mention that little piece as well with regarding the affordable housing. Um, you also have to address the predatory lending and as you've seen, um, in, and I don't know if you've witnessed it before, but my, my brother is a real estate agent in LA and you see that uh, predatory lending which can also be, can also impact home ownership 
you can have someone that is wanting to buy a home, is able to buy a home, but unfortunately they get services or they get uh, recommendations from someone that's actually taking advantage of them. And since they're not really knowledgeable, we really have to target how we're addressing the predatory lenders and um, how that's also impacted the housing market. When the boom happened um, uh, for, during the recession, one thing was regarding those predatory lenders that were targeting specific communities, low-income communities that were promising these great opportunities to owning their home, and, and, and the, with the housing inflation, with the pricing going up, I mean, people sacrificed. They lost their homes because they could no longer afford it because interest went up and so forth. So we have to look at that when you're kind of tying affordable housing, you also have to look at the other aspect of it to make sure that they stay a homeowner, not just you give them the opportunity to become a homeowner and all of a sudden in several years they, they don't, um, they're not able to manage it and then of course the, uh, the interest rates goes up and they end up losing, they can no longer afford it. Um, so one thing that I do wanna do once I go up to um, Sacramento is also invest in trying to expand HUD and also trying to look at programs similar to HUD that how we can bring to here in California to better educate um, those that want to become um, homeowners. And we also have to look at the renting uh, affordable, uh, affordable rents within our community. So it can't just be excluded in certain areas. One thing that we found out in San Bernardino is that you look at the projects, they build these beautiful um, um, condominium style uh, apartments but at the same time, those that could no longer afford it because they do hike up the prices and they do pull out people that can no longer afford it. So in reality, they're, they're not providing that opportunity for housing, affordable housing. So we have to look at all avenues. You can't just look at one area. You have to look at different aspects of it and how we can improve. Thank you. Um, I think the main reason uh, we have this uh, issue right now is um, the cost of building the red tape and the high taxes. Um, I have a friend that is buying a house right now and the new regulations from Sacramento is to have six solar panels panels for $20,000. So that is outrageous. Um, another issue why we have um, some of the um, so that's simple for me in my, in, my, in my head it's very clear it's the taxes, the red tape and uh, the many regulations. Um, in the last 30 years, we had many wars and we have a lot of homeless on the streets because mental health is not provided for them. So a lot of them are on the street and they cannot afford a home because they are not mentally um, healthy. Um, so having, having said that, um, I don't think I wanna go in circles because everybody pretty much covered it, but um, for me, it's clear it's taxes and red tape. Thank you. Okay, the final question this evening. Our country and our state are divided today more than they have been at any time since the Vietnam War. I have a bunch of people out here who remember the Vietnam War. If you are elected, what would you do to try to bring Californians together? I will start with Rosalie. Well, those who know me and have interacted with me know that I'm a people person. Um, I agree. I think one of the reasons why I'm running is because um, there is a lot of animosity and a lot of um, uh, hurt in our, in our communities, in our society, as a state, and as a country. I believe in civility. I, res I believe in respect. I believe in the individual, um, in the individual period, and I believe in the American spirit. So having said that, um, one of the things that I wanna, wanna do is build relationships um, across the board, across the spectrum. I think that's important, um, especially as someone who will be representing the voice of um, the people in our district. Um, my number one priority will be to build those relationships here in our district, as well as in Sacramento. Um, especially because we are, you know, as a Republican, I am a uh, super minority up there. So bringing that balance back into that is, is very important to me. And as a mother, I'm looking at it as I have three children who I said earlier, I'm raising to be incredibly respectful and civil human beings. And it starts with leadership, I think, and setting the tone that we want um, in, a, in our country and in our leadership. So my promise, my pledge would be to be civil and respectful, to give people um, the opportunity to be at the table and express their concerns. 
um, and carry that across. Be one that is responsible um, in, that, in that manner, setting the tone as a leader. I think that's important. Chris. Thank you. So as a business owner and I guess as a journalist too, I deal with all kinds of people. I've dealt with, I've been yelled at by people on the right and on the left as a journalist over the years. But what I did learn is to listen to the other side. I don't think that any one party or any one type of person has a lock on the best ideas. And unless we're open to hearing the other side, we're gonna leave out a lot of really good ideas. We're not gonna hear the other side if all we're doing is demonizing the person sitting across the table from us. So I, I fundamentally believe that um, good ideas can come from anywhere and I want my door to always be open and my phone to always be on for you to hear from you. And I think that's where it starts. That's the kind of leadership that we need to have in Sacramento. Um, I will provide that kind of leadership. I will definitely listen to the other side as well. And I, I wanna tell you about one small little story about this. There was a, a police officer who now works in a pre-booking diversion program in the LA County that he wanted to tell me about. And this program basically intercepts uh, youth who commit a, a crime, vandalism or something. But before they get booked, he told me that if they get booked, that they end up 80% of the time recommitting a crime and end up back in the system because they go to jail and then they go back to jail. But if you intercept them before then and they do community service and they pay restitution and they apologize face to face to the person that they harmed, 77% of the time they never see, you never see them again. They clean up their act. It saved the county of LA $17 million by doing this, by keeping them out of jail and by providing community services to churches and community centers and schools and other good organizations. And I wouldn't have heard about a program like that if I wasn't listening to the other side. And so we have to be open to that and finding those solutions in every corner wherever they exist because we don't need, we. We don't need to make things more complicated, and we are in the most purple district, probably in the state of California. So I want to represent everybody in California, not just one party, but all of us. Thank you. Thank you. All right, great. Well, first off, you did mention the Vietnam War, and I want to recognize all those uh, veterans here, and I want to thank you for your service and your courage and bravery, um, first of all. Um, I, I actually worked at Riverside Regional Medical Center in Moreno Valley, and uh, one of the works that I did was to try to provide services for our Vietnam vets, and also with um, uh, victims, victims of crime, and that's when I was able to hear stories. And so when you connect with individuals that sometimes don't align with certain views, it's okay because at the end of the day, I'm here to service and I'm here to support you in any way I can. And I remember hearing their stories where um, they, um, you know, they were on the helicopters and they would spread out the um, Agent, Agent Orange. And then I would see individuals that uh, would come into the hospital with cancer, skin cancer, due to the Agent Orange. And this is a true reality. Many of them were not even receiving health care. Many of them were not uh, receiving even a, 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 a check from the government um, to help support them in some ways through through mental health or, or behavioral health or for whatever issues that they were dealing with. And when you look at the homelessness, um, it's, it's, it's high. And how are we specifically working with our Vietnam and our veterans? And so I say this because when you listen, and I'm glad that you mentioned it, when you listen and, and regardless of the situation that we might have different views, um, but it's okay because at the end of the day, we're here to support each other. And it's like earlier today, I heard from someone that this is we don't necessarily align with some of the views and might be considered, I might be considered something else. But at the same time, there are issues that we can see universally. When you look at education, when you look at healthcare, when you look at issues that pertain to um, the, air, the air quality, I mean, the reality is, believe it or not, there is smog and there's still issues. And I, you know, for those that don't necessarily, you know, believe in it, um, I walk outside of my house and I see it and I feel it and, and my children see it and they feel it. So it's a reality, how are we gonna work with that? But at the same time, I will not disregard what your viewpoint is. 
because you have the right to your viewpoint. You're feeling what you're feeling, and that's what I'm here to do. I'm here to take note and making sure that we're addressing everyone's issues, regardless of where you live, where you come from, or even your political views. So just letting you know that I'm one of those, um, yes, I'm a Democrat, but at the same time, I'm here to listen and I'm here to address your issues. And one thing as a school board member that I have experience with is working across, uh, working with our fellow board members, we don't necessarily see eye to eye, and, and we have a diverse uh, within party lines as well, but when it comes to addressing the issues with the community, we put things aside and we work together to find solutions, and that's what I'm here to do, to find solutions. So like I, I said at the beginning, I grew up um, marginalized in um, Romania as a Christian Romanian, but my parents always taught me to be respectful. I came to California, um, and as a Republican, I got involved in the union, and a union president in the Republican Party is almost like a unicorn. So um, I felt like I don't belong there, I don't belong there, where, I, where do I belong? But uh, my personality is a uniter and a peacemaker. So um, I want to reach across the party line. I want to work together. I want to make California great again. I don't know, when I came in 92, I thought it was heaven because I came from communist Romania. So everything was perfect. I don't know what happened meanwhile, but I would like to do that to respect, uh, to being civil and listening and talking. And um, that's my, my goal. Um, the rise of this problem is directly tied to social media. Um, someone else brought it up earlier, I think it was uh, Chris. And that is something that's here to stay. It's not something that we're going to be able to do anything about. Um, and I wish people would turn off their TVs and turn off their, their phones. Um, but to be honest, I never turn mine off. Um, <laughs> I can be feel connected. Probably an addiction. Um, but I agree that it has to come from the top. There has to be an example set by the other, um, our leaders. And our leaders are not setting that example. And I couldn't, couldn't agree with you more when you talk about the civility on an, on an elected board. Um, and I have a, a fellow councilwoman here with me tonight. Um, she's not here with me, she, but she's here. Um, and she knows, as you all know, that I get very passionate about my issues. And my passion <coughs> sometimes might come out like anger. It might come out like, hey, I'm mad, I'm gonna do something about it. And that's just sort of the way I am. But I think passion is important. But I think what we've learned and what I've learned being on the council is you get up there and you make your argument in what you think is the best interest of your constituents. It's not your best interest. Um, and then you, you, go to, you go to bat for your constituents and you make the argument the best you can. And then after the vote is done, you're done. You don't bring that up again. You don't, you don't harp on it. You don't let that issue carry on to the next issue. And I think what, what we don't see in Sacramento is we don't see, I mean, it's easy for, for me if I get to Sacramento, if I'm 11 of 40 senators, it's easy for me to say, come on, let's work together. It's the other side that has to say, come on, we, we embrace talking and discussions. And, and what I'm learning in my trips to Sacramento is that there is an attitude up there. And, and I gotta tell you, there's an attitude with Republicans as well, that I don't need your help. And, and the Republican, uh, Republicans now have this attitude that before the last election, uh, Republicans had to work together. If they didn't work together, they couldn't, they couldn't change or make a difference because they just didn't have, they, they didn't have the numbers without working together. It doesn't matter now whether they work together. They do not have the numbers. And I have it on good authority that the Republicans up in Sacramento have taken an um, all-in-for-me attitude. Their attitude is, why should I work together with my fellow Republicans when I can't get anything done? So I'm going to work for myself and get and improve and promote myself. And that is something that, that Republicans have to follow, solve that, but we have to all talk about it. And I think what happens is you have to be open, you have to make a good, strong case, but you also have to be willing to listen and um, can't speak about it because it's closed session, but there's recently an issue that came up in our closed session where I was on the losing end of the vote and you just gotta move on. And, um, and it's, it's easier said than done. Thank you. Thank you.
very thoughtful answers throughout tonight. I, I thank you for that. We'll now turn to closing statements. You have three minutes each. Chris, you can begin. Well, again, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. I believe firmly that you are the solution to all of the problems that plague our society and that your engagement is critical in everything that we do. The lack of voter engagement and the you know 30 plus percent of the people who don't vote is the biggest problem that we face. And I think that it's because so many people feel disconnected from their government that we won't listen to you or that we won't do what we say that we're going to do. I've been frustrated by that many times. And I just, I want you to know that this is the most important thing for me is that you go and find five friends and get them to vote. However you will vote, I just want to see you there, out and, and being involved in your community and voicing your concerns. Because that's what we need. We need people to come back to the table and to believe in their government again. I hadn't been a politician before, I had not run for office, but I have accomplished a lot of other things in my life, from being a journalist to running my own business. And I think that that speaks to the fact that I am able to build things and work with a bunch of different kinds of people in different fields and bring those skills to the table in politics. So I'm learning as I'm going, for sure, but I don't think that any of us really know is able to know everything about every issue that we're gonna face, and the things that you care about today are likely not the things that you're gonna care about passionately three years from now. And so it's important to have somebody who sits up here who is studying the issues, listening to people, having their ears open and their eyes open to what's happening, and looking toward the future. I've heard a lot of people talk about this, this district and this seat and say that we need to in some ways settle. But we've settled for warehousing jobs and becoming the logistics epicenter instead of demanding that we have better, that we start framing this place as a place for innovation, a place for growth, a place for the future as LA's backyard with our and preserving our great open space that we have, as well as the wonderful housing that we have that we're developing, the family orientation that this community brings to us. So I wanna be your ambassador in Sacramento and I hope, my name is Chris Goodfellow, and I hope that you will send me there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. Abigail. All right, great. Uh, uh, what I'll do is I'll repeat my name in the beginning, I'll repeat my name at the end just to make sure that you remember. So I'm Abigail Medina, um, school board president. And so the my, my thing is looking at, you wanna have someone that first of all will have the experience and um, the, the, the first day that she enters Sacramento, not only will she start building those relationships across the aisle as well, but someone that actually has have a proven record for showing that she has been able to push for certain things when people will go against. I mean, I've been pushed against when I would try to um, try to look at how we were looking at uh, our accountability, how we were looking at our funding, and and typically people say, well, you don't have to worry about that. But at the end of the day, we want to have a a good budget. We don't want to have to owe money at the end of the day, and I keep saying that. But at, at the same time, we want to make sure that we're um, doing what's right for our students and what is right for our community. So it's the same practice of what we're doing at the small local level, although we're a big, uh, big school district, this will easily transition to building those um, and starting from day one to making sure we're looking at legislation that will help support Bullying piece is definitely one of those I mentioned that nobody's really looking at how we're gonna change that. When you look at special ed, I mean, that's one thing that I've been pushing for in our school district. We actually need additional fundings and this has to come through the state. It's not coming from anywhere else. And when you look at our children that are being bullied, that's another aspect of it. When you're looking at uh, someone that will be working directly in our community, we'll be walking in communities that nobody walks. I remember going to neighborhoods during the 16 election, even my school board election, and they'll say, Abigail, we never had anyone come to our door. And so the reason why I mention this is because many of our, our, our residents, uh, our voters, are, are considered low propensity voters. And what does that mean? No one's reaching out to them because they don't vote, vote as frequently. But at the same time, we're creating this cycle because nobody walks to their door, nobody connects with, nobody calls them, nobody is sending a mailer, then how are we gonna actually effectively engage those voters in having their voice? 
um, come out. And, and when I went to some of these doors, um, during the 16 election, some of them had their Trump sign. But at the same time, I still spoke with them because there were issues pertaining to education, issues that were pertaining to their communities that I was there to address. And at the end of the day, they said, we'll vote for you, Abigail. So for me, it's trying to look at what the issues and what, uh, what solutions we can try to provide. And I wanna let you know uh, that I've done this before and I will continue to work and, and fight for your needs and your issues. Uh, and um, honestly, I can say that I am the, the one here with the most experience, not to put anyone in, in, in any other area, but uh, the experience of, of doing this work, uh, and it shows. Thank you. And Abigail Medina, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. So there is no balance in our Senate at this point. Uh, the Republicans are facing an uphill battle, battle. Unless we have the power of persuasion on our side, 11 to 29 will never get anything done. Uh, but Republicans can have the best ideas for our state, but uh, those ideas will remain, remain, remain just that, unless we can convince some Democrats to vote on our, uh, the way we vote. Uh, what we need are people that can work together people who will resonate with all members of the state Senate. We must, at least me, I must not abandon my conservative values. And um, coming from a communist country, I have conservative values. But at the same time, um, we need somebody smart and cunning and the way we present some of our leg the legislature to get the necessary votes. I have the experience, I have the knowledge and acumen to be the person we need as a bridging a state senator for, to represent District 23. Um, I'm Christina Poracci. Let's make California great again. Thank you, Christina. Well, I want to start by thanking all of you for coming here and giving me another opportunity that I got five years ago. Um, but I also want to thank everyone up here for coming. Um, it, it's my backyard. You guys came to my backyard. I promise you that I will go anywhere you want to go. And I think we should have more of these. I think it should be all five of us because I tell you what I learned today, and I think this is probably a wake up call for any Republicans who are watching this. There are two very formidable Democrats up here, and they, they have a lot to say. And when the person who wins this election, when he gets up to second, <laughs> he will be the only one that's, that sits up on this diet at this table that can say and honestly claim that they took on corruption in City Hall and they won. He's the only one who can claim that he's lowered property taxes. There aren't too many candidates in the entire state that can claim that they raised property taxes. I only know of one and he's not a candidate. That's my uh, colleague on the council, Michael Hartman. Uh, and so, and uh, I'm sorry, also the rest of the council. We all, we all did it together. Uh, but we do need someone who has experience. I'm also the only one who can claim that I brought jobs to my community. As a school board member, you don't get the, you don't get the chance to make those kinds of decisions. You're just not put in a position where you have to uh, decide whether or not to uh, raise prices on homes or to pass taxes and, and things like that. So it's not something that, that other people get to do. And I gotta tell you this, Abigail, I don't need to tell her this, but when you run for school board or you run for city council, it's different than when you're running for state senate because now there's a letter behind your name. There are a number of people in this room that have come up to me since I announced that I was running for state senate. First thing they said to me is, I never knew you were a Republican. I wouldn't have voted for you. <laughs> so I know it's very hard um, what we're doing here, and, and I think what we need, and this is now I'm gonna speak to the Republicans, so I got one minute left. We, this is a purple district. I think it's a little redder than purple, but it's one of the last conservative Republican districts in the state. And these two are formidable. And so Republicans need to have a candidate who can speak with experience, who has a record that they can run on, and that has been through the mud and been through the drug. Those of you who live here have seen the, the social media claims on me. I've been called a pedophile. I've been called. You too. Uh, I've, had, yes, <laughs> I've had pictures of my home blasted on social media and said, go find Lloyd's home. I know what it's going to be like to run in this. And it's not easy. It's something, that, it's something that's a lot of hard work. 
and it's something that we need, and we, I'm talking about Republicans, we need to make sure that we have the strongest candidate, the best one who has an opportunity to keep this district red. And uh, vote LloydWhite.com <laughs> and click on donate. <laughs> sure. I'm a daughter of immigrant parents. I'm first generation born here. I am grateful. I live every day with gratitude in my heart. I've seen the principles that um, have made this country great. I believe I was raised with a work ethic. I was raised um, to believe in self-respect and respecting others with civility. Um, when it comes to experience, I come from a real estate perspective for 16 and a half years. I've sat on, this, on the real estate board for our community, um, the East Valley Association Board of Realtors. I have sat on the school board. Uh, recently, my husband has been on city council for nine years. So I've been privy to the um, to the scope of issues that come to the cities because of legislation from Sacramento. I've also been privy because I've sat on the chamber board um, for the Utah Chamber of Commerce. I've also been privy to how legislation affects local businesses. Um, I have made decisions on a school board. We do that at every school board meeting. We do that on every board that I have sat on. I've also worked as a field representative for a local elected um, that has allowed me to attend different meetings and different, um, in different jurisdictions throughout the, the district. I have met with many of the constituents within District 23, build relationships because that's important. Um, having that respect for our fellow human beings is incredibly important. Understanding the issues that are coming down from Sacramento, the one um, size fits all, um, doesn't fit in California. We have different demographics, we have different topographies, and what works for San Francisco, what works for San Diego or LA, um, doesn't necessarily work for the Inland Empire. And we need to have someone that understands that. Having said that, he goes, I want to go to Sacramento and be the voice. I didn't run the, for Senate because I wanted to do this. I'm running for Senate because I went out to the different communities that I have worked with, that I have lived in, and I asked, would you trust me to be your voice in Sacramento? Do I have the values that reflect your life and your values to represent in Sacramento? So it's not something that I'm doing for selfish reasons. I'm doing it because there is a need. I'm looking at it as, as I'm a mother with children who would like to have her children come back after college and make California their home so that I can see my grandbabies in California one day and not having them move out of state. So I'm hoping that I can bring you on board and win our team and know that I will be a voice, that I'll have a listening ear for the issues that are most important to you as an individual, whether you're a child or a senior, a young adult, or the head of your family. It's important that you have a voice that listens and understands what the issues are that are important to you and go to Sacramento and build those relationships up there so that we can pass legislation that brings balance into the legislature instead of having the ramifications of bad legislation of one party rule. Thank you. Thank you.